Ayah number 38. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, ma lakum, ma lakum idha qila lakum unfiru fi sabeelillah itha qaltum ila al-ard. Araditum bil hayati al-dunya min al-akhira, fama mata'u al-hayati al-dunya fi al-akhira illa qaleel. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here addresses the mu'mineen. He changes gears now. He's, he's addressing the believers. O oh, you who believe, what is the matter with you that when it is said to you, go forth in the way of God, meaning for jihad, you sink down heavily to the earth. Are you content with the life of this world over the hereafter? Yet the enjoyment of the life of this world compared with the hereafter is but a little. Now what's the context of this verse? Now bear in mind that this surah, as we've mentioned, was revealed after the conquest of Mecca. And these we're talking about, you know, when Allah says, Ya ayyuhal amanu, you who believe, Allah is addressing some of the veteran companions of the Prophet. But these are people who have been with the Prophet in many battles. And now they are being called upon to go to another battle. But this battle is unlike the previous military expeditions. Now, brothers and sisters, the Prophet in addition to being a prophet of God, a messenger of God, he was also a very skilled military leader. The Prophet ﷺ, when he would mobilize his men to fight in jihad against his enemies, the Prophet usually, almost always, he did not reveal to his companions who were going to be fighting, you know, where we're going exactly. The Prophet was very discreet because you know there was a military strategy at play that the prophet did not want to divulge so in many cases people would join the prophet's military expedition but without being really without being told what is it, what actually is going to uh, transpire so they just trusted the prophet and they would go with him and they were not familiar with how many people they were going to be fighting who they're going to be fighting they would join this time the Prophet tells his companions who they will be fighting in the battlefield. And this is something that is rare in the Prophet's conduct. Now, this is revealed regarding the Battle of Tabuk. Now, the Battle of Tabuk is a battle that actually never took place. Now, Tabuk is about what? After the conquest of Mecca, the, the Roman Empire, especially after their victory in the Battle of Mu'ta, they were emboldened. And the, the Prophet receives intelligence that the Romans are planning an invasion of Hijaz. They're planning on invading the Islamic Empire. So the Prophet he tells his companions that we have to now leave Medina and we have to march to intercept the Roman army. Now, the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, many of them, they were terrified when they heard this. Because up until now, the companions of the Prophet, they fought against who? They fought against Arab tribes. Now the Prophet is asking them for the first time that we're not just fighting a tribe. This is not just a skirmish with one of the tribes of Quraysh. We are now going to face off against a superpower, the Roman Empire. So we're not talking about nomadic tribes. We're not talking about clans. We're now going to war with an empire. So 
Tabuk is positioned between Mecca and Sham. And the Prophet is asking the Muslims to join him. So now the likelihood of being killed in battle is very high because they're fighting with the Romans. And the Romans were, were very well known for their, their skill in the battlefields. So now we're fighting professional fighters. When this happens, many of the companions are reluctant. And this is why Allah says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, ma lakum idha qila lakum infiru fi sabeel Allah thaqaltum ila ard. What's the matter with you? That you, when you are called, when it is said to you, go forth for the sake of God, you become very heavy. And this is, you know, a figurative, this is figurative language. Allah says that, you know, you sink down heavily to the earth. You don't want to move. You know, have you seen toddlers when you want to take them out and they protest? What do they do? They throw themselves on the ground. This is how Allah is describing, you know, many of those who are with the Prophet. They don't want to, it's like they're, they're, they just fall and they sink into the earth. They don't want to move an inch. So why were they so reluctant? Number one, this is the first time they're being asked to fight a superpower. Many of them are afraid. They, they, they don't feel like they have the, the skill set to fight the Romans. Number two, Tabuk is far away. Tabuk is a long journey. Many of the battles of Islam took place where? They took place you know, on the outskirts of Medina. Maybe it was a half a day journey, one day journey. It wasn't too bad. Now they're being asked to go all the way to Tabuk. So in addition to fighting against a superpower, we have to travel travel for days and meet maybe even weeks to arrive at the battlefield. Number three, many of the Sahaba, they were reluctant they were telling the prophet you know it's probably not a good idea to to fight they were afraid they were telling the prophet it's not a good idea for us to go one of the reasons that's mentioned is that this was in the summertime so it's hot and it was many of them especially in medina they were farmers so they wanted to reap their harvest this was the time to reap their harvest they've been putting in all all of this work in the springtime now it's the time to really harvest and you know make your money for the year. So it was the perfect storm for them. So we're fighting a superpower that we're probably going to lose against. It's a long journey and there's an economic loss that we're going to incur if we leave Medina, if we leave Me Mecca and Medina and go and fight. Allah says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amen. And even the tone of this verse, it's a very stern tone. Allah says, O you who believe. And typically when Allah says, O you who believe, what follows is something that will have a bearing on your faith. That now you have to demonstrate your iman. Ya ayyuhalladheena amin, O you who believe. You can't just say that I believe. Now you have to demonstrate, you have to prove your faith. Ya ayyuhalladheena aminu ma lakum idha qila lakum infiru fi sabeel Allah thaqaltum ila al-ar. You know, brothers and sisters, it's interesting that this is the ninth year after the hijrah. The Prophet passes away in about a year and a half. And you have all of these people who are surrounding the Prophet. So that, you know, we're not talking about one or two people. Allah reveals an entire ayah because this was a serious problem. Many of the companions did not want to join. How do you compare these companions with someone like Ali ibn Abi Talib? You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, in, in ayah number five or six from Surah Al Jumu'ah, He calls out the Jews. You know, because the Jews claim to be awliyaullah, the chosen ones of God. Allah tells them, 
يا ايها قل يا ايها محمد صادق قل يا ايها الذين هادوا ان زعمتم انكم اولياء لله من دون الناس فتمنوا الموت ان كنتم صادقين the true friends of god those who are truly chosen by god are the ones who yearn for death they don't run away from death they're not afraid so you see the attitude of many of the companions when they're called for jihad they sink towards the earth they don't want to die and these are the these are the individuals who are going to choose who's, who khalifatullah is these are the individuals that are going to they're they are going to choose and elect who is the khalifa of the prophet and then you can't you contrast that with the spirit of sacrifice that we see with ali ibn abi talib when ali ibn abi talib is called to fight does he sink towards the earth or does ali ibn abi talib time and time again say wallah labnu abi talib in anasu bil maut min al tifli fi fadi umm by God, the son of Abu Talib yearns for death more than a child yearns for the breast of its mother. Amir al-Mu'mineen was yearning for this liqa, for this meeting with God, which happens through, through death. And then Allah, he criticizes these companions. He says, Are you content with this worldly life over the hereafter. Now, brothers and sisters, this is when you really see if people have Iman. You know, anyone can claim to believe in the Akhirah, to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but true faith is really manifested, you know, when, when a person feels that their lives are coming to an end. For those of you, I remember when I was in when I was in high school, I took a course. I'll never forget it. It was a course called health occupation, and we would go to the hospital, and we would kind of overshadow different units in the hospital. And I remember I spent about a month just observing uh, hospice and palliative care. And believe me, brothers, and, and for those of you who are not familiar with hospice or palliative care, these are people who are sent to a unit in the hospital and they're no longer receiving medical treatment they're just there to to naturally come to the end of their lives and believe me in that room you can see who truly believes in the akhira and who doesn't and sometimes you see muslims his name is muhammad his name is you know ali or you know qasim they're muslims by name but they're uneasy they're very restless knowing that their lives are coming to an end and then you have certain people who are at peace they're at total peace with this idea that my life is coming to an end because it's not the end so this is a way that you know if the soul is very agitated and restless when it's confronted with death there's something wrong there that there's a deficiency in iman and another time when our faith in the hereafter is, is tested is when we have to sacrifice our lifestyles for our Islamic values. It's very easy. You know, this is when you really demonstrate that you prefer the akhirah over the dunya. This is why Imam al Hussein, alayhi salam, when he rose in the year 61 after the hijrah, there were there were there was not a shortage of Muslims. The, and Imam Al Hussein was in Medina, then he went to Mecca. He was surrounded by Muslims. Many of them were Sahaba. Many of them were second generation Muslims. Many of them were praying and fasting and performing Hajj. But what does Imam Al Hussein السلام, say? He mentions a very sad reality about many religious people. He says, "Anasu abidu dunya." People are slaves of dunya and religion is just something that's on their tongues they talk 
They'll mention this hadith and that hadith and they'll talk about ayat of the Quran and they'll speak to you about the Prophet. Religion only exists on their tongues and it doesn't permeate. It's just on their tongues. <laughs> they will be religious as long as life is good, as long as their sustenance is taken care of. That's when they have no problem. They'll pray, they'll, they'll fast. They have no issue. But when they're tested, this same person that prays five times a day, this same person that goes to Hajj 50 times or goes for Ziyara 50 times, if they're in a position where they have to put their lives in danger, this is where Imam Hussein says the religious people are very few. They're very few. How many people supported Ali ibn Abi Talib? How many people supported Imam Hussein? I will be religious as long as my lifestyle is not threatened. As long as I'm safe. As long as I don't have to make any sacrifices. Or I don't have to make major sacrifices. Some people will, will make financial sacrifices. But they'll stop if it comes to their own safety. You know, people usually have a limit to what they're willing to sacrifice. But Imam Hussein says, when people are called to make supreme sacrifices, the people of faith are very few. That's when you see, you know, the weeding process really taking place. The enjoyment, Allah says, of this, he tells these Muslims who are, reluctant to fight, who are afraid, who are clinging to this world, Allah says, are you, you're satisfied with this dunya over the akhirah? Don't you know that the enjoyment of this life compared to the hereafter is so minimal, it's so small. There's a beautiful hadith from the Holy Prophet ﷺ, he says, the Prophet says the parable, the comparison of, of the Akhirah to the dunya is like taking your finger and dipping it in an ocean. So the ocean is the Akhirah. And this dunya is dipping your finger, and whatever remains on your finger, that is dunya. So Rasulullah says, you have this ocean ahead of you, alam al-akhirah, but you're obsessed with these little drops on your finger. You're willing to sacrifice everything for these little drops. You know, if you, brothers and sisters, if you look at, the lifespan of a human being. Let's say, hypothetically, you live a long life, and many people don't reach the age of 90. But let's say, hypothetically, you live until the age of 90. Let's divide your life. One third of your life is sleep. So take away 30 years. So now we're left with 60 years. One third is what? Another third is work. You have to work, you have to make a living. And most, most people, they hate their jobs. So. Let's take away another 30 years. So now you're left with 30 years. The first 10 of them or 50, you don't even remember it. You were a kid. So let's take those away. Say, take away 10 years. You have 20 years. Were you healthy all the time? No, you were sick. So take away maybe a few years here and there. Then you have stress, problems. You're stuck in traffic. You're, are you, so when, when, you, if you're, when you look at it, if you look at the moments, the time of pure joy that you experience in this life, believe me, I, I would be surprised if, if it's more than a few months of pure relaxation and enjoyment. You're willing to sacrifice a few years, a few months for eternity. This is what Allah is saying. فَمَا مَتَاعُ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا مِنَ الْآخِرَةِ إِلَّا قَلِيلٍ And then in ayah number 39, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he makes a threat. Allah says, 
إلا تنفروا يعذبكم عذابا أليما ويستبدل قوما غيركم ولا تضروه شيئا والله على كل شيء قدير. Allah says, if you do not go forth, he will punish you with a painful punishment and will replace another people in your stead and you will not harm him in the least and God has power over all things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, he employs, he has different ways of motivating us. Sometimes Allah motivates us to do things with the promise of reward. And sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he incentivizes us to do things with the threat of punishment. And sometimes Allah threatens to punish us severely and immediately. And this is, this is the beauty of the way that Allah speaks. Allah doesn't have ta'aruf. You know, you and I, especially in Middle Eastern cultures, you know, even if we want to make a threat, we're very formal, we're very polite. Allah has no ta'aruf with mu'mineen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to them very clearly that if you don't do this, I will severely punish you because there is a higher purpose. There is a higher goal that has to be achieved. And, you know, maybe some of these companions were thinking that, you know, if Allah punishes us, who's going to help his religion? Who's going to help his prophet? We're all the prophet has. You know, as though some of them have this attitude that we're doing Rasulullah a favor by supporting him. That we're doing God a favor by being religious. Allah says, if you don't, he's like, I will severely punish you. If you don't go forth, I'll severely, severely punish you. And I will replace you with other people who will be willing to be a part of this movement. You know, there's, a, there's an interesting story. It's a funny story, actually. You know, many mosques, many communities are always in need of funds. You know, mo most of the time when we go to a masjid, part of the program is fundraising, right? Our masajid are in need of money, funds. So there was this great scholar who was invited to speak at a community, and he spent some, a considerable time with this community, and the the board of the, the masjid, they met with him, and they said, uh, Sheikhna, uh, we really need you to... Uh, to motivate the people to give, ask them that, ask them to help. You know, we're in desperate need of their help. We need their support, their money. So we want you to go and motivate them. So this alim, after hearing this from the board, that, you know, we need money, we need support, you know, go, go out and talk to the community. So he stands in front of the community at the masjid and he says to the mu'mineen who are sitting, he says, that we have these projects and we don't need any of you nor do we need your money so the board was shocked what are you saying we don't need we don't need you we need their money he says no no we don't need you allah doesn't need you and he doesn't need your money this is something that's being done for the sake of allah you need this project if you don't want to help Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will replace you with people who will help. So we're, we don't need you. Rather, we're asking you to be a part of something that is pleasing to Allah. If you don't want to give, it's fine. We don't need you. We don't need you and we don't need your money. You need to connect yourself to a noble cause. Because there will be a day when you stand before Allah and you have to have more to show for than your salah, which you don't even concentrate in. This idea, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling these sahaba that I don't need you. You need, it's, it's an honor for you to stand besides the messenger. Allah says, you're replaceable. You have to ask yourself, do you want to be a part of something that's greater than yourself? And you will not harm God in the least. Don't think for a moment that you're doing Allah a favor. And this is, and we'll end with this, this is why Musa alayhi salam, 
one of the most important lessons that he taught Bani Israel, because many of the Bani Israel, they probably thought to themselves that we endured the tyranny of, of, uh, of Fir'aun and we supported Musa and we were with you as every step of the way. They probably thought that, you know, we've done such a great favor to Musa and to the Lord of Musa. Musa alayhi salam in Surah Ibrahim, Surah number 14, ayah number 8, he says, وَقَالَ Musa." Musa says to them, because he started to see this attitude of, you know, that, you know, you owe us or we've done God a favor. وَقَالَ مُوسَىٰ إِن تَكْفُرُوا أَنْتُمْ وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَغَيْنِينُ حَمِيدٌ O Bani Israel, if you reject God, and if every human being on earth rejects God, you will not harm God in the least. Allah is independent. He's independent and He's praiseworthy. He's ghani and He's hamid. In the next ayah, inshallah, ayah number 40, Allah will, not, will then give us an example about how he is able to protect his prophet even when Rasulullah is alone in a cave. Now, there's someone with the prophet and we'll mention who this individual is. And inshallah, it's a very interesting discussion about you know the, the prophet in the cave with Abu Bakr. We'll uh, inshallah leave that for next week.